It is good to have everyone back again, and this is Palm Sunday, and I uh, I do have to admit that it is uh, it is a privilege in more ways than one of being in Florida on Palm Sunday because we are surrounded by palms. I don't think that you're going to find very many palms in Michigan or Indiana or Pennsylvania or uh, Minnesota or Georgia or any of the other places. Indiana, I'm, I know I'm going to miss somebody here. Uh, where? Kentucky. Kentucky, that's right. Kentucky, West Virginia, the list goes on and on. Um, that's not to say that you may not have a palm inside a building somewhere, but living in Florida and experiencing the weather here uh, and seeing the palms swaying. We have perfect weather here this morning. It is in the 70s, and if it's cold where you are, tough. <laughs> it's, I guess, is all I can say. Uh, but we send, I, I'll send warmth through the camera here. Hopefully you just, just get close to the screen and you'll sense the warmth. This is Palm Sunday. And what a blessed, blessed time it is as uh, we spend this time together and we, we prepare our hearts for next Sunday, which is Easter. 
it is hard to believe that it is that time of year again and I was sharing uh, with the congregation that uh, you know we we talk about Christmas and we talk about Easter and we talk about Pentecost and we we talk about so many different things that find themselves on the church calendar right all of these dates and all of these Sundays that we celebrate for one season or another during the year and we forget that the gospel story is a year-round story nothing changes it is the same permanent story of what Jesus has done on our behalf wherever you pick up in the story wherever in the year wherever you find yourself celebrating and recognizing it is still that same story that transcends all of time and one of these days one of these days we're going to see Jesus face to face now whether there's palms in heaven I don't know but I will promise you this there is going to be praises in heaven there is going to be shouts of hallelujah and glory to God in heaven there will be people that says they will cast their crowns we will be given a crown of righteousness we're told and it says that we will cast our crowns at his feet putting palm branches and olive branches and clothes at his feet that's nothing. Wait till you see crowns being cast at his feet. Oh, I could go on and on and on. I would like for us right off the bat to take a look at our passage located in Luke chapter 19, verses 28 through 40. Uh, for those of you at home, it's going to pop up on the screen. And for those of you that are here, you can read along. After telling this story, Jesus went on toward Jerusalem, walking ahead of his disciples. As he came to the towns of Bethphage and Bethany on the Mount of Olives, he sent two disciples ahead. Go into that village over there, he told them. As you enter it, you will see a young donkey tied there that no one has ever ridden. Untie it and bring it here. If anyone asks, why are you untying that colt? Just say, the Lord needs it. So they went and they found the colt, just as Jesus had said. And sure enough, as they were untying it, the owners asked them, why are you untying that colt? And the disciples simply replied, the Lord needs it. So they brought the colt to Jesus and threw their garments over it, for him to ride on. As he rode along, the crowds spread out their garments on the road ahead of him. When he reached the place where the road started down the Mount of Olives, all of his followers began to shout and sing as they walked along, praising God for all the wonderful miracles they had seen. Blessings on the King who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in highest heaven. But some of the Pharisees among the crowd said, Teacher, rebuke your followers for saying things like that. He replied, If they kept quiet, the stones along the road would burst into cheers. <laughs> God's word for us. What an absolutely wonderful powerful demonstrating passage of scripture for us to consider on this day it is exciting to read any time but it takes on a special focus when it's Palm Sunday the fact is this passage is a powerful passage every day of the year and it demonstrates some unchanging principles that should be evident in the lives of God's people every day now I titled this passage or this message evidence of an entry evidence of an entry and I'm going to warn you in advance that we're going to be talking about the triumphal entry of Jesus but we're going to be dealing with what does that have to do 
with us. A good expositor, a good inductive Bible study method is to look at a passage and to say, what does it say? Right? Why does it say it? Or so what? You know, so what? It says that. And then now what? So what? So what? Now what? What does it say? Why is it saying it? And what does that have to do with me? That's where we're going today. So you need to kind of, we don't have seat belts here in the sanctuary. You don't have seat belts at home. But you need to buckle up. Because what this is going to do is this is going to put every single one of us on notice today to respond to what this passage teaches every day. Are you ready? You ready? Did you bring any steel-toed shoes this morning? Just brace yourself. First of all, God calls upon each and every one of us to be driven by divine purpose. To be driven by divine purpose. Jesus always pressed on towards Jerusalem. He didn't give up. He didn't take a detour. He always pressed on. And it said that his face was set to Jerusalem. He knew his divine purpose. And there was an internal drive to go on and to fulfill that which he knew that he had to do. He knew that he had to press on. So that's what the passage says. Why does it say that? Because it shows us the determination in Jesus' own life and spirit that he was being obedient to the Father. I don't know about you, but I wouldn't have been able to face crucifixion. I would have been worried sick over it. I would have been terrified. And I'm sure that he was terrified. It says that when he was praying, he, he sweat drops of blood and pleaded if there was any other way. But if this is what has to be, Father, then not my will, but yours be done. That's why he did what he did. But what about us? How does this touch us? We are called upon to seek out God's purpose for our lives. We too can and should have an internal drive beyond our own understanding. There should be something on the inside of us that pushes us on in our faith and in our relationship with God. Folks, if you don't have it, by God you better seek it. Because that's the only way that you're ever going to get to see Jesus. It's the only way. You can't make excuses. I was too busy on Sunday. I was too busy with my life. I had other things going on. I did not have time for Jesus. I did not have time for religion and faith in my life. I had other things to do. I'm a good person. That's all it takes. Folks, you will be in for a shock. This internal drive will give us peace in our service. It will give us determination in hard times. It will give us an anchor when doubts come. It will be one thing that will hold us when the whole world is going to hell. It will sustain us. It will keep us. You say, well... How do I know that it will keep me safe in the midst of hard times? You don't have hard times now? Do you think that you, you're not going to have hard times if you don't follow Jesus? Folks, hard times is a fact of life. I mean, I'm, I'm preaching to the choir here. You know what 
hard times and difficult struggles are. You know what that's all about. But what a difference it makes when you have Jesus going with you through those struggles. It don't make them go away. It makes them bearable. It gives you a strength beyond yourself. So yes, God calls upon us to be driven by a divine purpose. Secondly of all, God calls upon us to be faithful in our obedience. Jesus called upon his disciples to act. Now, out west, to go just pick up a, an animal that wasn't your own was called rustling. <laughs> and, and people got hung for things like that. But Jesus called upon his disciples to act. He gave them the particulars. He told them how to respond if questioned. He said, I want you to go on in ahead. And he says, you're going to find the colt of a donkey tied there. And he said, I just want you to untie it and bring it back. And if anybody says anything, well, just tell them I sent you. Tell them that the master has need of it. I don't find anywhere in this passage where they questioned Jesus. Not a question. Jesus gave them a very particular job to do that was highly unusual. And it just says there in verse 35, so they brought the call to Jesus. <laughs> There's two, two places there, verse 32 and verse 35. Both of them says, so. <laughs> Jesus says this, so. Folks, do you under, understand what that means in our life? When God calls upon us, when Jesus speaks to our heart and life, our next response, our immediate response should be, so. I did what he told me. So, I obeyed him. So, <laughs> it just, it goes right along with the words like, then. <laughs> Jesus said, go and do this. Then they went. It all fits together. So the disciples acted upon <laughs> Jesus' command. How does that apply to us? We are called upon to be faithful when we are called upon. How many times, and please don't raise your hands, please don't answer this out there, because I really don't want to know, but I want you to know. How many times when God leads you to do something that you take a moment and ask why? Ponder that for a moment. How many times do we ask why? <laughs> How many times do we demand more information? Well, I don't know how I'm going to be able to do that, Lord. I, you know, I know you're leading me to do it, but, but I just I don't understand how that can happen. Can you tell me a little bit more about it? How are you going to meet this need? How many times do we hesitate and we lose the opportunity? How many times do we hesitate? There's an old song that says, Almost Persuaded. Almost Persuaded. And the end of one of the stanzas says, Almost, but lost. <clears throat> Almost. So we're called upon to be faithful with God as well. Thirdly, God calls upon us to be sensitive to recognizing God's voice. See, now here, here is where you, have, you no longer have the excuse of, well, how do I know that it's God? Because <laughs> usually that's, not only do you ask why, sometimes we say, who is that? <clears throat> Somebody knocks on your door, you go to the door, you say, who is it? When Jesus knocks at your heart's door, do you say, who is it? You know who it is, but just in case you raise that question, this passage also says that we are to be sensitive to God's voice. Jesus foretold of the ensuing question of the cult owner. This is where it really gets fun. It really does. 
Okay, guys, I want you to go in and I want you to untie the colt. And if anybody asks you why, just tell them the master has need of it. Jesus' disciples recognized that Jesus said that it was going to happen. So they're, you know, what, what do you think was going through their mind as they're untying the colt? I mean, I, I probably read way more into scripture than I should, but at it, 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 the very least, it makes it interesting. But if you can imagine the disciples reaching over and they're trying to untie this colt, and they're doing one of these numbers, you know, they're, they're kind of, and, and John's looking over Peter's shoulder. He's like, will you hurry up? He's got it in a knot here. What are you doing with that coal? The master has need of it. Oh, okay. Peter? Did I? Do you get the feeling this guy already knew? Yeah. Now Jesus has been with us because we've been on the road, so he didn't come here. He didn't come ahead of us. None of the other disciples came ahead of us. How did he know? How did he recognize our response? And why was he so at peace with it? Hmm. I have an answer for you. You want to hear it? Because God had already spoken to him. You see, Jesus didn't need to run ahead. God was already there. <laughs> and God had to have spoken to that owner and he recognized the words of the disciples as the same words that God told him I mean that's not a stretch is it so here we are back to us again time for another toe stomping if we are to hear the voice of God okay here's an if if we are to hear the voice of God we need to start listening. That means sometimes it requires us to shut off all the noise. Remember back when we talked about noise? Sometimes, I'm sure that this doesn't apply to anyone online, and I'm certain that it doesn't apply to anyone here, but I'm just going to say it. Sometimes our complaining drowns out the voice of God. Can't believe I'm doing this. This isn't going to amount to anything. <laughs> Folks, once we hear the voice of God, it will not be mistaken. Because your heart will swell up in your chest and you'll feel it beating with a, sp a new vibrancy and you'll recognize that that's God getting a hold of the center of your soul. You will not mistake the voice of God when you recognize it. Fourthly, God calls upon us to be open with our praise and our worship. Jesus was not yet to the destination before praise broke out. <laughs> it just, people started getting happy. And he hadn't even arrived yet. Word traveled fast. And the crowds did not hide their adoration. Now, you have to understand why this was extraordinary. Because up till now, remember when Jesus healed someone or touch someone, or performed a miracle, what did he say? He would, at most, would say, go show yourselves to the priest, the priest, or he would say, don't say anything to anybody. It was all hush-hush. Why? Because he didn't want it to be about the stuff. He didn't want it to be about the miracles. He didn't want it to be about the special interactions with certain people. Now, all of a sudden, here's a crowd of people, 
And he's, he's just allowing them to just go off the wall with their praise. Why? Because it was time. It was time. You see, when it comes to us, a praise hidden in our lives is silenced by a lot of factors. There's a lot of things that quiet us down. Fear is one. What is, what are other people going to say? They're going to think I'm some kind of a religious fanatic. I'm kind of afraid of, of what, how people will talk. How about doubt? Considering praiseworthiness. Do we sense that we have a right to praise God? Folks, if you're breathing air and your heart is beating, you have reason to praise God. Another aspect is uncertainty. We say, well, what if it's not God talking. There's a fellow by the name of last name of Knapp that wrote a, a little thin book years and years ago. It had been out for a long time before I found it, and I found it a lot of years ago. And the book is titled Impressions. And in that book, he gives a fourfold test when you feel led that God is doing something and he says is it scriptural is it right is it providential and is it reasonable if it falls apart on any one of those just wait and God will make it plain and you know that's served pretty well is it scriptural is it right is it providential is it reasonable that will help with our uncertainty also our praise can be killed by our silence until indifference takes over. You know, you feel that burst of excitement and then you have second thoughts and you say, eh, well, let me think about this for a minute. And then it, that excitement and enthusiasm kind of goes away and it just leaks off and it's gone. Lastly, God calls upon us to be aware that spectators and scoffers exist. Hmm. Even Jesus faced scoffers. In the midst of all of this praise, in the midst of all of this huge crowd that was screaming out and praising him in the midst of all of that jubilation. <laughs> uh, one of the Pharisees, some board member, spoke up and said, rebuke your followers for saying things like that. Quiet them down. They're getting a little too excited. So in the midst of praise, there are always going to be those who will complain. There are those who will oppose praise. There are those who will see no call for praise. There will be those folks that say, just calm down. We don't want people to think we're weird. Let me tell you a little bit of something about thinking that maybe things is weird. I had my procedure last week. You know that. I was moaning and groaning about it. Everything went fine. They found a couple of things, took them out, said no big deal. Not that I didn't worry about it until I got the, you know, I'm, I'm human. I thought about it, worried about it. So, well, what about, you know, what if? Well, it wasn't. But when I came out of my, my anesthesia, I was in AFib. I was not in AFib when I went in. When I came out, I was in AFib. And not everybody knows that I've, had a battle with atrial fibrillation a few years ago. I've had two electrocardioversions, which is where they put the jumper cables on your chest. You're not awake when they do that, thank God. 
And I also had an ablation where they actually go inside the heart and cauterize the misfiring nodes so that your heart gets back into a regular rhythm. It's not a terrible procedure, but it's still enough to give you a little bit of concern and pause. And so there I come out of the anesthesia. I was not in AFib before I went in. I was in AFib when I came out. Fought with that for seven days. You have any idea what it's like having a heart rate of about 140 for seven days? It was a little concerning. And I kept telling Emily, I said, you know, I, I just feel like I'm a little out of breath and I know what's going on. I take my EKG every day. I know exactly, I knew what it was. I, and I thought, well, because they took me off my medication five days before the procedure, right? I thought, I just need to allow the medication to get back into my system and everything will be fine. And I was finally sitting there one day and I said, you know, this is just silly. You know, I'm wondering when it's going to stop. I mean, it's an acceptable question, right? You wonder when it's going to stop. And finally, I just said, Lord, this needs to stop, and I want you to stop it. This needs to go away. And I'm trusting you to take care of it. You want to hear the rest of the story? Within an hour, it was gone, and it hasn't been back since. The scoffer would say, oh, don't say things like that. It was just the medication working. Don't say things like that. People will think you're crazy. <laughs> I am crazy. <laughs> Those who know me well know me best. I am crazy. I'm crazy about God. and I'm crazy about Jesus. And he makes a difference in my life. And he makes a difference in your life as well. But there are always going to be those that are going to be skeptical. Jesus faced that. We will always face opposition. We put forth the presence and power of God. Our faithfulness is an affront to those who do not believe. We actually become offensive to people who have no faith. They don't want to hear about ours. And they say, well, I, I just don't want to talk about it. That offends me. Okay, well... By the time you know that it offends them, guess what? You've already told them. You've planted seed. Don't make it an argument. Just let the seed germinate and let it go. Some will sow, some will water, some will reap. Okay? Just realize that you did your job. God told you to say something you did. You're not responsible for their reaction, but you are responsible to be faithful and to do what God asked you to do. And once you do that, you have done exactly what God wanted you to do. If we are silent, God will use any means to show praise. Now, I'm just curious of the folks here in the sanctuary. I I should have polled uh, I should have polled the online audience before, and so if if you have an answer to this, please send it to me in an email and describe it for me. Uh, but I didn't get a chance to poll the the congregation here but just out of curiosity have you ever heard a rock talk okay uh, yeah <laughs> yeah it makes noise when it hits you but we're not talking about language here <laughs> But this passage says that Jesus' response was, if they kept quiet, the stones along the road would burst into cheers. I'd like to know what a cheering rock sounds like. <laughs> Folks, if we are not obedient to God, it does not mean that God's work will not get done. It just means that it will, get, it will not get done and he will not use us to do it. But God's will will always be done and he will make it happen by any and all means possible. And he is offering you the privilege of being a part of it. It's an honor to be asked. <laughs> Goodness gracious. If we had a high-ranking official walk into this sanctuary this morning and pointed at each one of us and said, I have a special job for you. Would you do this for me? We would do everything we could to make that happen. Why? Because they're a famous person. We know them. We respect them. But now if Jesus walked into this sanctuary, 
If Jesus walked into your living room at home and said, I have a job for you. If you saw him with your eyes, it would be different for you, wouldn't it? So why is it so difficult not to see him with our hearts and to hear him? He's giving us the opportunity, the privilege of being used by him in a special way to make an extraordinary difference in some situation. Now, if that doesn't give you a little bit of hope and a little bit of encouragement to just try it, I'll guarantee you there will always be a blessing. In conclusion, then, the presence of these elements, purpose, obedience, recognizing his voice, praise and worship, and recognizing that there will be scoffers, in all of those things, Christ still made his triumphal entry into Jerusalem, and he can make a triumphal entry into our lives if we open ourselves up to him. If we dissect the facts of the story and remove any one of these elements that I've mentioned, the story loses all of its power. You don't believe me? Go back and watch this sermon again. Watch this video again and look at all of those things. God calls upon us to be driven by divine purpose. God calls upon us to be faithful in our obedience. God calls upon us to be sensitive to recognizing God's voice. God calls upon us to be open with our praise and our worship. God calls upon us to be aware that spectators and scoffers exist. If you take any one of those things away, the whole story falls apart. Why? Because that's the truth of life and it's the truth of service and it remains unchanged. God calls upon us to be complete, to be complete in our purpose, complete in our obedience, complete in our sensitivity to God's voice, complete in our praise and worship, and complete in our understanding that we will be opposed. So then let each one of us allow Christ to ride triumphantly into the hearts of our life that we can experience consecration and service to him. <laughs> Happy Palm Sunday. <laughs> That's just getting started. And I'm not sorry if I stepped on anybody's toes because it stepped on mine too. Because I've been guilty of those things. I've done those things. We all have. We've all failed God in one way or another. But every moment is an opportunity for a fresh start. You don't have to wait till Palm Sunday. It can happen anytime. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you for the power in your word. The fact, oh God, that you do call upon us in ways, quite honestly, are beyond our understanding. But it is not beyond our experience. I pray that your Holy Spirit, if, if we have shunned you in any way, if we have hesitated in any way to cause you to hesitate, Lord, we invite you to come back and try again. And we promise that we will tune our ears and open our hearts and listen more carefully. And in the midst of all of that, Lord, our fears are still there, so we ask for your peace. And we ask for the boldness that only you can give and help us to see way beyond the moment to be able to see into the possibilities of what can happen when you are in charge and you allow your people to into the story you give us the privilege of being able to participate so lord we ask that it might be so if there be one here this morning lord in this sanctuary or anyone listening to this message online and they're saying you know i've never let jesus in oh god help them right now to just say jesus come into my heart forgive me for my sin i want what this passage spoke about this morning. I want this power in my life. I want another chance. 
I've messed my life up, Lord, and I don't want to keep doing that, so give me a fresh start. I'm opening the door of my life, and I want you to take a victorious stride right in through the open door and make a home in my heart. It's just that simple. Thank you, Lord, for your faithfulness. And I pray now as we prepare to, dispart, to dismiss from this place and depart from this place, may your spirit really go with us and use us in ways beyond our expectation and understanding, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.